All right, we're here on the Seneca Lake Wine Trail. We've just gotten off Route Interstate 90, the throughway at exit 42. Whether you're coming from the east or the west, you're going to be getting through the toll gate and you're facing this intersection north of Geneva. We're going to take off today and visit a bunch of wineries and kind of give people new to the trail an idea of you know where things are located and what some of the things are that you're going to be driving past. This video has been being made in the winter of 2012, February 2012 specifically. They may get updated periodically, so you may see portions of this video that actually are taken at a different time of year. Today in the car with me, I'm Paul Thomas, the current executive director of the Seneca Lake Wine Trail. With me in the car is Bev Stamp, co-owner of Lakewood Vineyards, Laura Lee Wagner, co-owner of Wagner Vineyards, and Ann Martini, co-owner of Anthony Road Wine Company. And these three ladies will be dominating the conversation, so you won't have to listen to me hopefully talk too much. And it's just kind of a casual way of, you know, kind of showing you your way around the trail and helping you better appreciate certain things about the trail and our region here that you might otherwise be oblivious to if you hadn't had experts like these three in your car with you. So good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. All right, so we've got a couple of minutes before we get to our first winery. So how about, while I concentrate on driving, the three of you kind of talk a little bit about the, uh, about the trail, when it was founded, how many members, just kind of general information about the trail, which I know you're all very well versed in. Began in 1986. I'm not sure of the, the member wineries. I think Prejean was one of the founding members. Lenora. Lenora. Madlands. Um, uh, certainly Wagner's. Was Lakewood? No, we came in in 88. Okay. And Anthony Road joined in 1990 when we opened our tasting room. So, um, and how, what, what kind of got the trail? got the trail started uh, there's more of a story to it than just it wasn't like wineries got together and said we shall form a trail and, and so it was it was I think a little more organic than that right yeah um, from talking to Libby Prejean uh, they they just wanted to have a group of people so you know a group of wineries where people could come and uh, visit uh, not just one winery but several wineries Actually, and then they started doing events, but they didn't begin until, I think, the 1990s. Early 90s was the first wine trail event. Yeah, I think Deck the Halls was probably well, the, was it the first one, or was no, there a, no, a the barrel one. tasting event, maybe? The or? first one was the Fruiting Wine Festival right. that um, uh, Liz Stamp worked on that one. Right. There were, I think, five wineries originally, and we put five our $100 in as our of our startup cash uh, and we bought these little fir trees as our giveaway and had a wine and food pairing but then the next year came along and we um, anybody who wanted to join us for a hundred dollars they could join it and be part of the Furling Wine Fest and I don't remember how many maybe three years it went on it was it was our beginning yeah. working together as a trail it was about three years then uh, Deck the Halls would have been the next event that was established. And that was Liz's idea. Yeah. Yes. My daughter looked. And yeah, then the Deck the Halls, I think, this year, I think is its 21st Deck the Halls. I think you're right. So that would have placed that at, what, taking place in 1991? No, it was... Uh, the first yeah. one? It was uh, 1991, yeah. Because we opened in 1990 and we didn't do it that Then there was another one, Art Around the Lake, that we had in the early uh, time frame. Mm -hmm. What was, was it called again? Art Around the Lake. Oh, okay. And that was only a one-time deal. <laughs> we invited artists or painters or to come in and be our guests at the wine. We show their wares, and uh, it was a good thing, but it just didn't keep going. Yes. Well, yes, it wasn't real happens. popular. Well, it's funny because we were just, you know, people listening in on this who don't know the working the inner workings of the trail how we just talked about not even a year ago maybe doing an art event uh -huh. and I forget that some of these things are new to me you know, it's only been around the trail for half a decade where it's you know stuff you guys have done been there done that right 
So we're coming into Geneva, which is at more or less the northern end of the, of the lake, which is, I just see as the lake trout capital of the world. Yes, it is. Woohoo! <laughs> and it's a beautiful town, I can confidently say. Uh, they have the Lake Trout Derby every Memorial Day weekend. And uh, there's a cash prize for the first, second, third winners. People come from all over to fish. It's one of the deepest freshwater lakes uh, in, the, in this country and the world, I think. I think it is, too. Yeah. 630, I say 635 feet, I read 632, mm -hmm. something like that. It's below sea level. Oh, I see. The bottom of the lake the is below of the sea lake level. It's below sea level. Ah, that's interesting. So it, it rarely freezes. Last time it froze was 100 years ago, 1912, in February. There's been a lot of pictures online of the lake when it was frozen during that time. It is recently. not frozen now. No, no it is not. <laughs> Far from it. Has not frozen in a hundred years. Not even close. We were hoping, I can honestly tell listeners and viewers of this clip, that we were going to have a beautiful, snowy winter day to show off with beautiful blue skies, which we, we have periodically. We do once in a while. But it's been a, it's been a relatively snow-free winter this year. You know, and you warm. Can, and warm, warm. surprisingly really warm. warm. And on that note, I just as we're still getting into town general conversation, is the warmth. Explain to the listener who's maybe not as aware of vineyards and grapes and all that. What is there danger with warmth? With a warm winter, is it risky? What are the risks with it, or is it no big deal? Um, we've been pretty lucky so far. Um, we have not noticed any uh, buds swelling or anything like that. So. Um, it, it's been uh, cool enough at night to, to keep that from happening. I understand that uh, people in Long Island are having some bud swells, so, so they're a little more concerned about it than we are here. So far, so good. And, and the worry then, when you talk about the blood bud swelling, for those of us that aren't that aren't not growers, have no uh -huh. green thumb whatsoever, is the if the buds come forth in say February, like maybe in Long Island, they're facing that, then you get a hard freeze. Right. And, and it, you lose, yeah. It just, mm -hmm. and that means for that that vine for that year will produce very little or no grapes. Right. Is that correct? You well, might get you, secondary uh, buds coming. But. I think it goes a little deeper than that. You get that sap in the cane, and you get a deep freeze. You're going to crack the cane. Mm -hmm. you, and you could crack the trunk of the vine, and if the crack, if the vine, the trunk cracks, the vine will die. Mm -hmm. So it has to be replanted. So if it got very very cold here in, in a couple of weeks down in the negative 10 or 20s, that would be very bad. Right. And we don't have the snow cover to insulate the vines. That's what we really like, the snow cover, for insulation and for moisture in the springtime. So we had a lot of moisture in the fall of 2011. Yeah. <laughs> but so far, so good. Yeah, the Vines so are far. okay so yeah. far. And you said, Anne, I think that it's because somewhat that's what's helped somewhat was is the fact that the evenings have been cool, right, they, and that's kind of kept the buds night, yeah. kept the buds in where they're supposed to be sleeping, right, and not doing anything. Yeah, there's no um, trimming so far. There's been no sap flowing, which would be devastating if we got a, a real low temperatures. Another thing about the weather is it's been great for people working in the vineyards to get out and work in the vineyards because they're not walking through a lot of heavy snow, and so they're happy. <laughs> yeah, right. Although we're headed towards March, and in March they walk around with about five to ten pounds of mud on each foot. <laughs> true. Um, true. If it gets warm and the soil begins to thaw, so. So they, the folks watching the video can't see it, but right now to our left we got the Ramada in with a big. It's a fairly large building with blue roof, so it's distinctive, which is right next to the lake. We're kind of right now on the just north. Just past the Hampton Inn as well. Past the Hampton Inn, we're at the northwestern end of Seneca Lake. Mm -hmm. And, um, and this is downtown Geneva, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful little restored, bucolic, nice little little downtown district, a lot of little private, you know, independently owned businesses. Is that? Yeah, and old. This is a, a old town uh, city. It was a big vacation city for a lot of people coming up from New York City. Um, I need to turn here, don't I? Yeah. Well, right. Yep. Stop okay. Sign. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. We just passed a wonderful coffee shop called Opus. <laughs> yeah, plug Opus. They are nice, aren't they? <laughs> uh, lunches, and now they have a wine bar. And they, the I evening. assume they serve a good representation of Finger Lakes yes, wines? Yes, they do. Yeah. Excellent. 
And then we're going up Seneca Street and uh, a very historical building will be on your right hand side called the Smith Opera House. Um, a lot of music people have come here and played and said it's one of the most acoustically correct places they've ever played. And it is beautiful. Yeah. It's been all restored. Some nice restaurants. I love churches. <laughs> just architecturally. Mm -hmm. Looks like a castle and I just am a sucker for castles. Mm -hmm. so if you go to Europe. <laughs> oh, right. That's lie. all it is, right? <laughs> exactly. That's my son-in-law did that. Did the the great really? Pines, yeah. That's gorgeous. <laughs> Sam. The neat, neat thing about Geneva and Watkins Glen at the southern, the town at the southern end, is that you have this nice old downtown district that is a reasonable walk from a lot of the accommodations. Mm -hmm. Right. So you yeah. can go out, you know, you can come back after a day on the trail, have a beautiful dinner someplace nice, and then trot around town and not even, not even have to climb back in the car, which I think for some folks who live in bigger cities maybe is a something they aren't used to when everything's nice and nice and close together. The row houses that are on either side of. 14 heading south um, used to be a lot of offices and banks and uh, have been turned into residential places and they're very historical and we're right close to what's the school Hobart William Smith College which is to our right it'll be on your right and the campus main campus is on your right but they have um, they own the houses on the left by the lake as well you want to go 30 miles an hour here, the watchers and view listeners of this video clip, because there's a lot of people, little students and whatnot, crossing over all the time. Right. So it's good to, you know, I'm not a big fan of speed limits, but I'll be the first to admit. But this is a place where I tend to go to the speed limit because it's just. Perfect. And there is a, a very noted area as you go past the colleges and go down the hill by the cemetery. Stick and to the speed limit. Lots of police. Yep. Hanging out in that area. Not that this video is about warning you about where policemen park. But <laughs> however, <laughs> it is a notorious place for that. Yeah, these but are beautiful old homes, too. Hobart, I think, uh, is at least uh, probably 200 years old, the campus, the buildings, and early 1800s. Elizabeth Blackwell was one of the uh, people involved here. We got the lake to our left now. In case you guys are still going the speed limit with us, you'll see we're, golly, no more than 100 feet from the lake, I'd say. And some, I think we've got some fraternity houses, don't fraternity we? Fraternity houses, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and residential. But just lovely old homes. Mm -hmm. That is a pretty district. And some nice B&Bs, I believe, are tucked away in here, too. They are. I'm terrible with the names, of course, but. There was the Bragdon House. That's right. Um, back a little bit further on your left. And here's the place where you want to, the temptation going downhill is to start to end up to 35 and 40, and you just want to resist that urge and hold her to 30. Yes, but these are usually right over there. <laughs> pretty, pretty much, <laughs> yep. Uh, that's a beautiful home. It's up there. Houghton House, uh, okay. part of the colleges. And it's now an art center, and they have a lot of gallery shows there. Yeah. Well, there's a big old beautiful cemetery. Yeah. Geneva on your lake, oh, uh, Geneva yeah. on the lake is on the left, and that used to be a Capuchin monastery uh, many years ago, and uh, it's a beautiful place, wonderful reputation. Yeah, they really do. I, I had friends of mine stay there. Oh, friends of mine that are far wealthier than myself and they, they lived it up while they're here and they said they go to some of the best hotels in the world I can honestly say and they put Geneva on the lake oh. right up there you know the W and some other top flight facilities the beautiful gardens all landscaped and the, the, the traditional um, what is it Method. yeah there's a word is it Versailles it's very formal gardens, formal gardens. yeah All right, now we are coming up. We got the American Legion, and immediately after that is our first winery. This is where we're gonna really start things up in earnest. For those of you, I, we're likely gonna cut the cut the video here and start afresh on a new clip. But we've got Bellhurst right up here on our left, which is uh, we'll talk a little bit more when we pull in the parking lot. But it's a 
it's, it brings it all to the table. Not unlike uh, Granora and some other facilities, they've got the accommodations, at least two bars, and at least a restaurant or two on the premises, and of course, their winery and tasting room. And again, it's you know my favorite style of architecture, which is big, imposing castle. And uh, there is a, a resident ghost at Bellhurst Castle. Oh, really? Yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> and years ago in the uh, speakeasy days, there was a lot of gambling that went on here. Uh, interesting history. Yeah, well, how long has it... It's been around for a while. Oh, certainly. Uh, turn of the century, I believe. Turn of the... Oh. Turn of the 19th century. <laughs> 18th to 19th. So they got parking. We're driving past the parking because we're obviously not going to park today. Straight to the right there is the castle. It's kind of like the main older portion, I would say, of the facility. Right. Here to the left is the, the newer portion where the tasting room is located. And so, I believe this new portion is only about eight years old. 